Welcome to the Regen Brands Podcast. This is a place for consumers, operators, and investors to learn about the consumer brands supporting regenerative agriculture and how they're changing the world. This is your host, Kyle, joined by my co-host, AC, who's going to take us into the episode. On this episode, we have Rachel Patach, who is the founder and CEO at C. Cassis. C. Cassis, also known as Current Cassis, is supporting regenerative agriculture with its growing lineup of products made from black currants grown in Northeast regenerative agroforestry systems. Right now, the product lineup includes two alcoholic beverages, a bottled liqueur, and a ready to drink sparkling black currant cocktail. In this episode, we learn about how Rachel started the brand in her Brooklyn apartment, why black currants were federally illegal for decades and what brought them back, and how C. Cassis is planning to use a combination of CPG, hospitality, and agritourism to get black currant products into the mainstream. Rachel is a badass female founder who I really, truly admire. The stories of her brand and of the American black currant are ones of creativity, resiliency, and most importantly, hope. We're excited to share this one with you all. Let's go. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Regen Brands Podcast. Very excited to record on a Saturday today with my friend Rachel from C. Cassis. So welcome, Rachel. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here. Yeah. Well, we're excited to have you. Um, I'm still flying solo as Kyle is out getting married and eloping. So we send our big congratulations to him and Heather. Um, But Rachel, for those who are unfamiliar with the brand, just give us a brief overview of what y'all do and what you make. Sure. So we are at the core of Black Current Project. We are obsessed with black currants, fresh flavor of fresh black currants, what their health benefits are. Um, we make a black currant liqueur that's a little less sweet, a little more vermouthy. It's only sweetened with honey. It's made with all Hudson Valley grown black currants. So something of a new school take on creme de cassis. Um, lots of cocktail capabilities, really fun things you can do with it. And then we also, from that, make a canned RTD that is using the liqueur as the base, dropped down to 5.4 with distilled spring water, super well carbonated. It's like light, easy, refreshing, gluten-free beer alternative. Um, so we're just, we're, we're messing around in the beverage space, but we're, we're really into black curd. Yeah. Love it. And if, if y'all can't tell why I'm excited to have Rachel on this podcast after how dialed in that answer was, then, then now you know. <laughs> um, and Rachel, I think you're, you're a couple firsts for us, right? You're our first kind of agroforestry-based brand and our first um, alcoholic beverage brand. So really excited to kind of talk about those two topics. Awesome. And you know, maybe, <clears throat> maybe I should have researched this stat beforehand, but like, I'm curious kind of what the gen pop awareness level of for black currants or consumption is right kind of um, like next to nothing yeah and <laughs> you're you're going to be able to educate our our listeners on why some of that is in the historical <laughs> kind of framing of, of why that occurred but you know Definitely. i love the work that so many people are doing in the region ag space on the agroforestry side because it's really an amazing way to kind of re-perennialize uh, our agriculture systems and integrate trees and in, in a really the proper way rather than just this kind of general let's go plant trees um and we have to find a way to commercialize those crops, right? And um, educate consumers on the amazing nutritional and other kind of benefits of those things. So really excited for that. Um, but, you know, take us back. Like how, how did this whole thing get started and how did you become Black Current Obsessed? <laughs> <laughs> so I was pregnant, which I acknowledge mm. is a weird time to start a booze company, but I was <laughs> messing around with low ABV and no ABV things that were akin to what I generally enjoyed drinking. So things that were a little mm. more vegetal, yeasty, less sweet, um, mm. not finding a lot of options. It was sort of at the front end of the huge uh, NA boom. So now there are mm. a lot more people in that space who are making really interesting things, but there just weren't that many. And so I, you know, I had worked in hospitality for most of my life. Um, I was at that time still working as the director of operations and cultural programming at Wythe Hotel. And so I was having a lot of meetings where typically you'd have wine or, you know, you'd, you'd connect with someone over a, a beverage. And I was mm -hmm. having, you know, sweet mocktails or drinking a lot of just seltzer and lime. And I found myself, you know, having 
worked in kitchens for a long time and having that sort of general impulse to make things that satisfy what you're looking for, I started Mm. just trying things out on my own. Um, And so I'm like in this DIY laboratory in my third floor walk-up apartment in Brooklyn (laughs) and remembering (laughs) the flavor of fresh black currants from uh, when I was farming in France and and kind of fell down a rabbit hole. I was like, what's up with black currants in the US? Why are there no black currant mm. things? They're huge in Eastern and Western Europe. Like, mm-hmm. what's the deal? And fell into their weird backstory. Do you want me to talk about the the like blight and the legality stuff now? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I want to just add one, one like feedback or thought to the whole non-alk space, which is I've gone large parts of my adult life um, sober, right? And what I have found is like, like you said, I'd rather just drink soda water and lime versus most of the NA beverages. Um, yeah. Because one, it's cheaper, right? So from a cost savings perspective and two, like what I see from that landscape is a lot of things that they're just taking the alcohol and like keeping the beverage, the shitty experience that it is, right? Whether it's beer <laughs> or like, it still tastes bad. It still tastes like tequila, but you're like not getting drunk. Like to me, that's like, what, why? How is what that? are we doing here? Yeah. Right. So what I love about what you're doing is you're basically creating an NA like functional beverage, right? That delivers something that's worth paying for that, that is some source of enjoyment, whether it's a flavor profile or some sort of health and wellness outcome, instead of just let's keep the same shitty uh, formula or whatever, and just remove the alcohol. Like that to me is not a long-term winning strategy. Yeah. I mean, I guess I am totally with you. And to elaborate on that, you know, we don't make an NA yet, but we do, you know, rather than kind of, re-engineering something that already exists to tailor to the needs. It was approaching it from a different perspective and creating something Mm. from this source material that was totally underutilized, underrepresented, and is like phenomenal. It's such a cool flavor. They're like meaty almost and like really Mm. savory and have this big complex acidity. And so it has all these elements that are really interesting and like not well sort of implemented in the beverage space in the Mm -hmm. States. And even in in some of the places where they are really huge, they're often covered with so much sugar, I think because people are sort of shying Mm -hmm. away from these qualities that I find really compelling about the fruit. Mm -hmm. And they're like, well, that might be a little weird. They can be kind of funky and musty. And and maybe, Mm -hmm. you know, the the idea is that like the general population won't be into that. Mm -hmm. And I was like, no, let's lean in, baby. Like that's that's what's cool about them. Um, Yeah. And so started started playing around with uh, bringing increasingly large quantities of fruit into our apartment. And my husband was like, "What are we What are we doing here?" <laughs> <laughs> like I don't know. I was like possessed. Um, I, I had this was like I had a song stuck in my head, and I yeah. just kept trying, you know, different methods based on what I had learned from friends who are winemakers and brewers mm. and, and operations and things that I'd seen and kitchen techniques that I had, I had utilized in the past and getting closer to this beverage that I was imagining. And then, mm-hmm. and then I made it and started sharing it with friends, kind of had this like mashup methodology that's a little bit mm-hmm. winemaker. It's a little bit like rectifier, um, kind of close to closer to like a vermouth or a port. Um, mm-hmm started sharing it with friends who had bars and restaurants and they were like, girl, this is good. Maybe this is what you want to be doing. And I was like, I think it is what I want to be doing. That's cool. When, when in that journey, did you investigate kind of the historical aspect of this? And can you share kind of that with the audience? Like why, what, what is the history of black currents in this country and why maybe is the, the utilization and awareness low at this point? Yeah. So I, I sort of, popped into that story right away, you know, just starting to do a little research because I realized that, you know, I had seen a lot of fresh black currants in traveling in Europe and working on farms there and that they just maybe save for occasionally being available at the Union Square Green Market, like really Mm. didn't see them in a broad capacity here fresh or also, you know, had only really seen French creme de cassis show up or sometimes, you know, somebody would have like, a little obsession with Ribena. So they'd have that stocked. I, yeah. uh, my place in, in Brooklyn is in Greenpoint. So there's a big Polish population. And so there are mm. black currant things there, but they're like the black currant syrups. They're really mm. um, 
really straightforward um, kind of classic applications of the fruit. And so I was like, there's got to be a reason. Like, why is this happening? Why aren't they yeah. around here? We're so obsessive and kind of food oriented, especially at this stage in American culture, that it seemed strange. Um, and mm. what I found was that when immigrants started first coming over and bringing plants with them, they were bringing black currants, red currants, white currants, whatever. And the rebus uh, plant tends to carry a potential fungus that attacks white pine. It's mm. called white pine blister rust. So they're bringing in these plants mm. and the logging industry at that point we're using primarily white pine for a lot of construction. And so they uh, felt like that's, you know, that's a direct threat to our industry. Obviously mm -hmm. the logging industry is more powerful um, than the yeah. burgeoning black current industry at that time. And so they lobbied to have them banned. They stayed banned, wow. went to the States in the sixties. Um, and, and that's where it sits today. So it really takes a motivated individual in a particular state to rally for the black current. Um, and we're lucky so, to have that guy here in New York. So you're saying it was a federal ban, but now it's up to the states on whether they want to allow black current cultivation Correct. and basically state by state, someone has to lead that charge. Totally. State by state. There are blight resistant varietals. There have been for a long time. Wow. They don't grow perfectly everywhere. So there's places, you know, like in the central U.S. where they're probably always going to be banned, but it also doesn't wow. matter because they're never going to do well in that landscape. Mm -hmm. But like Pacific Northwest parts of Northern California, Northeast, like they grow fantastically. They like a little bit of abuse. They want to be cold for a certain number of days per year. So like mm -hmm. in those locations, they're, they're a fantastic and like untapped agricultural resource. Mm -hmm. I love it. So in this very like entrepreneurial kind of trial phase that you were in, what, what was the, the aha moment or like the unlock to really try to turn it into a business? Was it like, mm. Hey, I'm pregnant and I want to make the world better for, <laughs> you know, my children. Was it just like, Hey, I love this. I have this hospitality back. I'm getting a lot of great feedback. Was it kind of a combination of those things? Like what was the, what was that moment in time? Yeah. I mean, I think it's a little bit of everything. It was, it was all of those aspects and mm -hmm. it was like, <laughs> I'm say this is going to sound so so silly but like it's like a a joke that went on so long that it got taken seriously like i had just been like making this thing <laughs> that's that's real entrepreneurial vulnerability right there uh because i think a lot of things are like that <laughs> you know like i've been making this thing i was loving it i was obsessed with it i was sharing it with people mm. at work i was like bringing it to wife i was like joking with my old boss andrew tarlow about cassis cash and like you know making this yeah. giant black current thing and it well it seems so absurd because it was like mm. no one cares about black currants this is such a niche thing mm. but i'm having such an amazing like process with it that like i'm mm. gonna keep doing it and then i started like incrementally piece by piece being like wait i this is like some sort of calling and i do think that this tethers so mm. many of the parts of my professional background my like environmental curiosities, my penchant for making things that have a broader impact than just a like consumer capitalist aim. So mm. like it, it really, it was like very real, but I think, you know, it did sort mm. of come from that place of like play, which I think is important. Like, that's great. It, yeah. You know what I mean? Like it shouldn't, yeah. I, I just think that there's like something really genuine in that where like mm -hmm. you should indulge those impulses and be like, I'm having fun with this and I, this is, you know, go mm -hmm. from there. Yeah. Um, and so originally you were just making the liqueur, right? Is that correct? And you were mm -hmm. kind of, that's what you were kind of, okay, cool. Um, so take us through kind of the journey from that to like now having a production facility and opening a, a tasting room and like all that and like going into thinking about the RTD and thinking about future R&D and innovation. Like how, how do we get kind of to present day? Yeah. I mean, like. <laughs> that's, that's a dogged, big question. <laughs> dogged stubbornness and like yeah. uh, slight naivety. Um so I was making the liqueur. I was putting them in these mm -hmm. little bottles that I was Sharpie drawing like a bubbly C on. I was giving them to <laughs> friends. You, know, you can still like some of my friends still have pictures of these little Love things. That. And they were like indulging me. And I was like really kind of like following this weird possession and 
impulse. And um, yeah, I, you know, at some point I was like, tr- probably trying to respond to my, my husband and partner Steve's queries about like, what are you doing with this? Like, I think that, I think maybe this is something that I do want to do. And I think that maybe we could make a little business and like, let's start researching that. And so I really like dove in and it is not simple to make alcohol in the United States. It was a long process. Meanwhile, there was. Wait, wait. So was the original, (laughs) was the original liqueur getting made in the bathtub or what? What was the production (laughs) mechanism here? Shared kitchen? Like what what were you working with? In my apartment. Wow. Wow. It was like little, this 20 liter Agonox, like stainless steel Agonox that acted as like a DIY yeah. fermenter that then got transferred wow. to small, you know, jars and Cambros. And it was like, that's amazing. Very like quintessential cottage enterprise. Yeah. Sorry, I cut you off, but I didn't um, ask that. No, I mean, that's like <laughs> an important part of it. Um, and. Yeah. So then it was like, well, what does it look like if we did want to do that? And, mm. and how do those mm. operate? And like, to be perfectly honest, I think that's where maybe a lot of people with really beautiful ideas would stop. It would be right yeah. to stop at that point. Cause then you see like yeah. all of this shit that goes along with it. And it's like, right. it's so, it's so much. And, and kind of coupled with that, I think if you're, um, doing something that like is this sort of joyful organic pursuit and you're Mm -hmm. like, I'm going to fund this thing. Mm -hmm. Then you start going down the rabbit hole and you're like, Oh, I am going to have to do so much to like get this even just off the ground to see if like anyone would give a shit about buying it. And like, that's, that's kind of a gnarly roadblock. Like it's really intense to, to get past Mm -hmm. that. And that's where it just, stubborn, <laughs> like relentless yeah. me comes in and just, I was like, this is what I need to be doing. And so going yeah. through the like, you know, bureaucratic hoops of getting a liquor mm-hmm. license and figuring out where you're going to manufacture it and to manufacture alcohol, it has to be zoned mm-hmm. in a specific way. So at first I was like, oh my God, I haven't talked about some of this stuff in a really long time. And yeah. it's like, comedy hour for me to think about it now but like I was doing this in Brooklyn and so I was like okay we're gonna rent a space it has to be zoned light manufacturing and Mm -hmm. most people who have something that's zoned that way like the Pfizer building for example they know that and the rents are commensurate with that and Mm -hmm. I ran the numbers you know like I had I have an operations background and I'd worked in hospitality at that point for 15 years and so I was like okay well let's like make a little spreadsheet let's figure this out and I probably yeah. left like <laughs> 70% of the costs out of it like you know but I was like just run some basic stuff yeah and um and I was like oh there's no way there's no way I can like mm. last like I can't pay rent on a space like that for long enough to make it you know turn a corner mm-hmm. um and I was like, I like looked at spaces what? in the back of like people's gallery art space. Like it was just stuff that wouldn't work at all. Yeah. But what year was that, Rachel? How long ago was that? That was in uh, 2018 and 2019. Got it. Um, Got it. And so then in 2019, we were connected via friends who had moved to Hudson and were working with. Um, someone who had some properties up in the area and they were like, maybe there's something there. You and we had for years been trying to figure out a way to be up. So like, I like horseback riding and gardening and like talking to no one, like New York yeah. city is the most <laughs> illogical place for me to live, but I'm also like deeply curious and like yeah. sensorially oriented. And so I just like, mm. it worked for a long time, but mostly in the background, I'm like daydreaming about, a farm and like, mm-hmm. you know, space and, and being somewhere upstate. So we, we'd been looking for like years for a spot and, you know, didn't have much money and we're like, well, we'll never afford something in New York. Like, let's like mm-hmm. look at places we were looking at like houses that were, you know, 150, $200,000, but like needed a lot yeah. of work. Um, and so these, these friends were talking to us and we were already, you know, like halfway sold in, 
the idea of, mm. of being more upstate and, and yeah. have been actively trying to do that. And so we started talking to the guy who had some properties and we're like, oh, maybe do you have a space? And he had a, a small studio space, it was like more appropriate to an art studio than a, an actual Cassis yeah. production space. It's like a 400 square foot clown car on the second floor of a <laughs> multi-unit building. It's not, yeah. not, do not recommend. Um, yeah. And we, it was like a fraction of the cost of what mm. that, Sim similar mm -hmm. real estate might have been in right. New York. And so we started leasing that space and started working on licensing. And meanwhile, unprecedented global mm -hmm. pandemic yeah. started unfolding. And so it was like, you know, just going through a really slow development of like not uncertainty, but maybe there was something really stabilizing about having this thing that we were like trying mm -hmm. to build. Mm -hmm. There's so much, there's so much to pull out of there. Um, we could, we could do a separate <laughs> like eight hour podcast on the entrepreneurial journey of being, you know, having this joyful, creative, like vision, right. For the work. And then it has to get like shoved through the machine. Right. Um, which at the end of the day, attorneys and accountants run the entire world because they are like the, the pass through that all this stuff, like if, if you have a business needs to go through and, and, and regulatory and all the things. So we, we probably don't have time for that, but I just want to note that as like, I feel you, I hear you. And I know a lot of our, our listeners can, can definitely relate to that. Um, so you get upstate, you start moving and grooving. How do we get to <laughs> present day where you're kind of producing where you are now and you, and you open the tasting room. And I'd, I'd love for you to kind of speak to how you've thought about this, maybe a little differently than most of the people we've interviewed because of that hospitality background and that heavy food service um, piece, especially because it's Alkbev. Yeah. So we, we started making it in our, our little studio space in the town of Catskill and, mm -hmm. um, realized very quickly that like that space was not operationally appropriate or, yeah. you know, sufficient in square footage to really house a, a growing operation. And I think yeah. growth is such an interesting thing. And I love, I love talking about growth and growth strategy and ethical growth because mm. there's so many ways to do it and, and mm -hmm. there's complications with all of them. So mm -hmm. I think, you know, and conundrums built within them, right? Cause like growth implies mm -hmm. that you're, really financially successful, right? Like, oh, you've grown so much that like now you're doing this other thing. And that's not always the case. It's like, it's, they're not, yeah. they're not neck and neck, right? Like right. you, you grow in terms of what you can see as possibility and the reach and the potential for the thing that you're making and, and building. Um, but the, the like actual, financial mechanisms of the business often take years to catch up to that. And, mm -hmm. and so it's, it's a balance and, and sort of choreography of like when you do some pieces versus others, if you stay at the place where like, okay, the sales are here and the, and the space is here and you stay within that realm, then by the time you're like ready to grow, you might already be too mm -hmm. behind because it's going to take yeah. a year or two to like get that other kind of scale operation happening okay so that's all just you know like philosophically for yeah. us it was that the the space that we were producing in was so fucking annoying all the time that like we <laughs> needed to get out of it <laughs> like just like think of it like walk with me for like some just like tiny operational pieces of that space yeah. which was yeah. glorious in that we got to like prove our concept and start making this thing as an actual business and really just kind of like push a little bit into the like realm of like, can this be real and felt like, okay, we can, yeah, we can do this, but we got to do this in a place where it's like more uh, appropriate for it. So we, anytime we would get a pallet of glassware, which like for people who don't work in palace, it's like a 40 inch by 40 inch square. That's probably like, 
12 feet high. So it's just cases yeah. of glassware all stacked. Yeah. So that would get delivered to the street, Main Street in Catskill, and dropped on the street. And then we would have to unpallet it, like break it down mm. and like roll cart it into our little studio and then repallet yeah. it there. Meanwhile, there's like the peanut gallery of Catskill Main Street, like the town yeah. drunks being like, there's got to be a better way to do that. And I'm like, yeah, there's something better way to do this. I, I know. You think I don't see that? Yeah. <laughs> do you want to help? Yeah. And then Grab it's all, box, it was also like just me, basically, at the beginning. Right. Like, mm. you know, like I didn't build a team at first. Like I was like, this thing is not even going to be worth the time that I've spent on it so far, let alone mm. possibly be able to support paying somebody else to help me and that's I think also another interesting thing about entrepreneurship I know this is like about regenerative brands but just the entrepreneurial journey that I'm sure a lot of yeah. people could, could understand and and sympathize with is that it's really lonely at the beginning and you're like yeah. doing all of the things and it's far <laughs> too much for one person to do but the truth is right. that like by by and large unless you're like really funding this operation like you're not going to be able to involve anyone mm -hmm. else who can specialize in any part of it until much later mm -hmm. and so making that studio space desperately looking for a new space looked at pretty much every feasible possible commercial property in Catskill yeah. and the surrounding areas and yeah. then we, we had gotten we would gotten to this point where I was literally like knocking on people's doors who had barns <laughs> that looked like maybe they could work yeah. for what I was thinking. And we like got, we had this really great conversation with these people who live who are in Germantown near near our house and and they were like kind of indulging that they were like maybe yeah mm -hmm. but it was like such I mean it was like taking like a dirt floor like not structurally sound not yeah. plumbed, no electric, you know, building and bringing that. Wow. And that's like a massive undertaking. You're like mm -hmm. looking at big FEA loans and like a two to five year process of like mm -hmm. doing that. And we were like, we need a new space like yesterday. And it was right. getting dark. I was like, I don't know what we're going to do. I mean, we can keep doing it in this space, mm -hmm. in this format, but it is, it is rough. Um, you know, every case that came out then like once you're, you know, the 400 square feet, not sufficient for making actual giant liquid transfers. So you have to move things every time you want to do one thing. And then every time you pack up cases and you have enough to ship out, you have to hand pull them right. from the space. So like one by one down the stairs. Um, so then our friend was doing some work for a guy who had some commercial properties in Kingston. And he was like, you know, you should talk to Morgan. Like he might have a thing for you. And I was like, all right, I'll talk to Morgan. You know, I was feeling pretty like yeah. despondent at that time. Mm -hmm. And I, I texted Morgan and I was like, Hey, you know, that's who I am. And this person put me in touch and, he said, maybe reach out. And he was like, oh, yeah, which like in a, in a like what I now understand to be very like classic of Morgan. He just like really undersold the thing. He was like, oh, yeah, yeah, I got a barn. You can come check it out. And so I thought I was coming to see like another raw barn space that would need yeah. a full gut reno. And so I get here. And, and this is also a little bit outside of the geographical area we were focusing on. I had really liked mm -hmm. being in Catskill. I, li I liked mm -hmm. the, like, the energy that was there. We had a really great community of beverage producers and artists, makers. And so this is in Rhinebeck. And I was like, oh, it's a little far, but okay. I came to see it and I walked in and it was like he had done all of the annoying basic work mm. that like mm -hmm. like it was like concrete floors floor drains structural reinforcements drywall basic plumbing yeah. and electric and then stopped which is like a grace that almost no developer or like yeah. property owner has they're just like yeah. there's no ego in it he just made it brought it up to this really great place and then was like mm -hmm. waiting for someone to wow. fill that so like we both needed wow. exactly each other and I walked in and I like yeah. straight up started crying and was like you want to rent this to me like mm -hmm. like now like today mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. so we signed a lease very quickly on this space and started working on building it out 
to be like a, a functional skilled operation for our distillery. And then, you know, the, the long-term dream probably fed by all of like my background experiences and the different really mm-hmm. beautiful hospitality projects I'd worked on mm-hmm. was to have a place where we could welcome people in. And that's, you know, it's part historical path and like what I know, but it's also mm-hmm. because black currants are so niche that like having a place mm-hmm. where people can really connect with what we're mm-hmm. doing, the ways that we make decisions around the production and our sourcing, like our connection to the land and agricultural, what black currants even are and why mm-hmm. anyone should care about them. Like having a mm-hmm. physical place that can embody that and help to tell mm-hmm. that story is like huge in terms of just the educational component of our brand. Yeah. I, I see that as a major competitive advantage for, for brands, whether that's a home farm that's like truly vertically integrated that people can come visit themselves or just that or a, a really good job creating media around the farms that you're sourcing from. Like that is a competitive advantage to create the, you know, solve for that educational gap where most, where most consumers don't understand what they're actually eating or how it's grown. Um, so I want to pause on the commercial side, come back to it in a second, but talk agronomy really quick. And I'm going to give you the tough task mm-hmm. of like at a high level kind of explaining why agroforestry is regenerative and then specifically like how the black currants that y'all source are farmed. And just like for, for the listener that may be unfamiliar with this, like why is it regenerative? Why is it good? Tell us about the actual farming and the agronomy piece. Yeah, totally. So I'm going to just like preface what I'm about to say by uh, the fact that I'm like relatively new to agroforestry. Like I came to it via black currants and sourcing black currants. So we have um, a friend, Seth, who had been working with uh, some agroforestry guys that actually connected us um, through Propagate. And he had been planting chestnut trees with them at a property in Livingston, which is about 10 minutes from where we live. And he, you know, Mm. unrelated to what we were up to, they had decided to be planting black currants alongside the mm. chestnut. Um, and so, so I was like, you guys should talk, like you should just know them and like what they're up to. Um, and so we met up and, you know, I, it was very early on in the planning of that property propagate as just sort of like by way of a, a broad overview partners with landowners who have a sustainable vision and works yeah. with them on agroforestry development and implementation. Um, so they had partnered with the landowner there and they were like, yeah, we're going to plant black currants. And they planted some in, but there were still about two thirds of the plot that they hadn't planted. And so I got to work with them a bit on, you know, varietal selection and I worked a planting mm. day with them and I just got to see more of That's cool. that and talk a lot about the agroforestry aspect of it because I honestly didn't know that black currants worked so well in an agroforestry mm. application, but uh, they do. And, um, you know, why agroforestry is meaningful. I mean, I think, you know, there's any anybody who's around our age grew up in the time when like there was a lot of PSA messaging around trees and Earth Day and like plant a tree, yeah. but like that's real. Like the more trees that we have, the better it can support our ecosystem and environment, human health, biology. Um, and trees, trees like to be in community, like all of us. Mm. So Mm -hmm. trees don't want to necessarily be a monoculture. It's not going to solve the problem by like planting a bunch of the same kind of tree in like one spot and be like, okay, we check that box. Mm -hmm. Trees want a diverse and robust ecosystem. Um, Mm -hmm. And so finding plants that are like friends with the trees is huge Mm -hmm. to be like, okay, well, like how can we Mm -hmm. maximize the potential benefit of like how that soil economy is happening and like, how the different pieces of what the trees offer in terms of shade and environment and hospitality for different bugs and plants and animals. Um, And then what other plants kind of like fill in the understory and support that and how can those things be potentially monetized so that there's even more motivation for people to make those decisions that like benefit the environment and human health in a way that actually like is, reasonable expectation from a primarily capitalist driven society. Yeah. Is that yeah, good? I mean, I, <laughs> yeah, I love it. And shout out to the whole propagate crew. Um, they're doing amazing work and there's like this really cool burgeoning uh, Hudson Valley uh, agri, you know, ecosystem and specifically agroforestry. Um, and, 
you know, I, I try and break it down super rudimentary, which is just the vast majority of this country like was some sort of agroforestry savanna before we colonized yeah. and, you know, stole the land from the indigenous people and did what we do um, now. Exactly. Um, and so you can get really technical with the, they sequester carbon, they reduce soil erosion, they're, uh, they're perennials and not annual. So there's, there's a ton of stuff we could, we could geek out on. We'd probably send other people, uh, we probably send people to other people that are, have more expertise there than you and I. But I think at, at, <clears throat> at a rudimentary level, what, what I like is, it's diversity for the human being that's consuming, right? It has all these ecosystem services, but it's also diversity for the farmers. They're not so um, tied yeah. to one or two specific commodity markets and allows them to diversify their operation, which we come back to why we have this podcast to talk about offtake, right? And talk about the brands that people like you are building because that doesn't work unless there's a market, right? Or partners for those people to sell the actual stuff that comes off the trees or the farm too. Yeah. yeah, totally. Value added products are crucial to the future of, I think, farming potential in the US. And it's interesting being in the Hudson Valley because you talk to a lot of people who've lived here for a long time. You know, our neighbor across the street is a farmer and he sings that song where he's like, the young people don't want to farm and nobody wants mm. to work. And why isn't mm. it like the old days? And I try to have these really brutal and kind of honest conversations with him about like, well, it might be that we have put all of our subsidies in the wrong place and like the mm. structure of how the financials of that work are really tough to make mm -hmm. possible. And so it's a big motivating factor for me in creating something like CTCs where it's like that can tie to all of these practices in farming that I fully believe in as like future for this planet and like mm -hmm. make them actually function. Um, and then the, the other aspect of it is like, you know, the, the agroforestry stuff is phenomenal, but then black currants in general, I think are just such an interesting sort of agricultural resource to talk about. And, you know, one of the people that is so central to what we do is this guy, Greg Quinn. He was the guy that like rallied for the ban mm -hmm. to be overturned. Albany is sort of mm -hmm. like the godfather of black currants in the Northeast and <laughs> um, has like, he's Love amazing. That. And mm -hmm. um, he has these, you know, fields of black currants that are, you know, no pesticides, like barely, you know, weeded. He allows for the existing biodiversity to flourish within mm -hmm. those plantings. And that doesn't interfere with the way that they're harvested. And he has a whole methodology on like the distance planting and the ways that rows should be spaced so that it, it allows for that, yeah, to actually exist. And um and they're also really amazing for bees. The black currants mm. are super supportive of apiculture. And so we only sweeten with raw wild honey, which is made by Ray Towsey here wow. in the Hudson Valley also. And so that yeah. like this thing where it's like, it seems so obvious, but for some reason we like, you know, can't get there sometimes, but like the things mm. that grow together, go together, like in that sort of vein and philosophy, it's like that the bees mm. already love the black currants honey complementing the black currant flavor and the like bolstering of both of those pieces of that little ecosystem is one of the things that I think is really special about what we do here like mm. yeah I love that and I think the the challenge and the opportunity as an entrepreneur is for someone like you to step back and say okay what are the product formats right and what is the branding and the marketing and, and the strategy to really get this into people's mouths. Right. And, yeah. um, so would love for you to just kind of riff on how you've looked at product innovation and product formats to date and what you see in the future. I mean, you've done the liqueur, you've done the RTD, you've done a limited edition compo. I think that's the three main things. If I'm, my memory serves me correct. Mm -hmm. Um, but how do, you know, how does the agronomic and also the nutritional, and then also the category analysis of those products, like how do you find the perfect, intersection of that Venn diagram? I mean, I don't know how to be perfect in anything. I mess up all the time, <laughs> but in terms of like how I think about that like yeah. Yeah. structure, it's like, um, it's part sort of like 
natural innovation. So for example, mm. you know, with the advent of this space that we are now producing and we have a little more room to be experimental again, which was what like mm. where this thing came from to begin with. And I think is crucial right. for um, like my creative process and, and developing Hell new yeah. ideas for like what can happen with this. And so now that we have a little more space, a little more tank room, we can take, for example, 800 pounds of pressed fruit from one of our batches of liqueur and look at like mm. secondary and tertiary uses for that mm -hmm. potential waste material. Like we already have a whole compost thing like lined up and looped in where we work with ozone who are incredible and they pick up our, our, our vegetal waste. But what if it didn't have to be waste or what if we could do like two right. other things before it actually turned into that? And so from that sort of like brain path to kind of think about, okay, do we want to like look at rehydrating them for a, another co-ferment or for some sort yeah. of like piquette version of things? Or are we looking at salt curing them, which is something that we've been doing for mm -hmm. a good like year and a half now where we're looking at them like, like the way you would think about like an Italian salt cured olive. Um, mm. And so preserving the pressed currants that way and then looking at like, what can you make with that? So we're folding those into handmade crackers. We're put making things like the, akin Ooh. to like a tapenade with that. We're using them for yeah. the salted current compote. So it's like all of these different places where you look at like, okay, there's this core production. Mm -hmm. We know a lot more about it now that we're almost three years into existing as business and like, what are the waste pieces? Where can we lock things and where can we tighten it up? I look at that from also in terms of like a sourcing or a packaging perspective, like mm -hmm. any place mm -hmm. that I can eliminate anything that's single use. I do like for the honey, for example, we like get the buckets, we use them here, we wash the buckets, we take them back, Ray refills them like for, you know, beverage transfers, like large liquid transfers for source material with regards to like the wine that we use from our friends at Hudson Chatham. Um, bringing those in in vessels that are then reused again and again and again. So cycling things, mm -hmm. you know, the idea of being perennial in agriculture works the same in, in production yeah. too. And it takes, you know, a little bit more thought and a little more effort for sure. Mm -hmm. It's, it's not like the, the path of least resistance, but it's like the shit that you can just try to like yeah. do it better. Yeah. I love the desire for experimentation and creativity and also the waste reduction pieces. Cause it's like, that's already basically a cost on the business and how do you turn it into a place for margin expansion? Yeah. And that should ultimately be better for the brand and everyone else involved in the supply chain, i.e. the farmers and the processors and all that. Um, you know, one, one for sure. piece it's, of curiosity, yeah. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. No, I was just going to say that, um, in regards to uh, like beverage source material, I always freak out a little bit about my choices when I talk to friends who are cider makers or winemakers because the mm. price per pound on black currants is like five times what it is on those mm. uh, elements. So mm. in terms of margin expansion and like finding secondary yeah. uses for it, it becomes even more important to think about things that way so that you can make something that's sustainable and able to like house and support a real thriving business. Mm -hmm. I'm so happy you went there because that's where my brain was going to around just on the Alkbev side, right? We've had, and, and I take back what I said earlier, we've had two wine brands on. So we have done Alkbev. We just haven't done non-wine yet. Um, but we know you have to go through the three-tier distribution system. It's a totally different route to market than conventional grocery or, or natural channel grocery, right? And my assumption as a consumer is, people really value this like artisan vibe or, or points of differentiation that are like pretty mainstream, but they might not get all the way to valuing the nutritional piece or the agronomic piece or the ecosystem service piece. So how does that play into your strategy with go to market? I mean, you know, in the type of accounts that you target from a, from an Alcbev distribution perspective. Yeah. I mean, there's a couple of things kind of, within that that I think about a lot so um you know I'm like where do I want to start with it um yeah. I 
always kind of shy away from talking about the nutritional benefits of black currants, even though there are many, many of them because at the end of the day, I make alcohol and I'm like a little right. like wary of conflating right. that idea. It'd be like, drink this to be healthy. Like if you want to be right. super healthy, like don't drink alcohol <laughs> at all. Um, but yeah. <laughs> you're gonna do it anyways. This yeah. is like a better version of it. You know, like we'll eliminate yeah. the synthetics, we'll eliminate the commercially processed white sugar, like drink it made from something that is farmed in a way that you can really feel good about. And even further than that, you know, I think there's all those studies about like drinking a glass of red wine being great for your heart mm -hmm. health. Like black currants are psycho good for you. They're like four times the vitamin C of oranges. They have gamma linolenic acid, which is fat burning for the liver. They're full of anthocyanins, antioxidants. They're, you know, taming free radicals in the body. They're like, they're a super fruit. Let's go black and, currants. Um, I'm on the black currant train after we'll that. Go. Let's go. Let's ride. I know. Get it. Everyone <laughs> should be drinking black currant juice. Like, honestly, it's like going to lower yeah. your blood pressure. It's going to be a natural, uh, like, illness fighting, like, immunity boosting thing. I mean, we used to, like, joke, but maybe it's true. Like, I didn't get COVID for a really long time because it was just, like, mainlining wow. black currant liqueur daily. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's <laughs> not real don't listen to me um <laughs> but there so there's that stuff like you know that's yeah. there it's real i like the idea of these auxiliary non-alcoholic potential products because then you can really communicate more effectively with people around the things that are so mm. brilliant about black currants to begin with mm. all that said i think with beverage alcohol and sometimes with you know, other things in, in CPG or RTD space, like almost not talking about that stuff has a power in and of itself. And like, this is something, mm. this is so like not fully formed. And I feel like you and I mm. could have like a really awesome, like hours long conversation mm. about what I, the things I'm about to say, um, mm -hmm. this is like where you're going to kick mm -hmm. me off the podcast. But I think that like on up from a branding side, yeah. from a branding side, I'm almost like not putting things like regen or organic certified, like those things. There is like a classism built into that structure yeah. that is really complicated. Yeah. And I think mm -hmm. that if you're looking at something from the perspective of like, this product is amazing. And I really mm -hmm. believe in its potential and the way that it impacts the environment and human health and all of those pieces, like that's going to exist. That's real. That's mm -hmm. happening already. Mm -hmm. And the best thing you could potentially do is to get that to the most people possible. Mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. like really democratizing it. And like, I don't know stats enough about people's uh, like beverage consumption behavior but my guess mm -hmm. is by seeing you know what things are mostly on the shelf and what everybody's drinking like day in day out it's like mm -hmm. a good majority of people do not give one shit about whether something mm -hmm. is horrifying for them or not and so mm -hmm. almost like not talking about it is really powerful to be like that mm -hmm. like the can I think about this a lot with the can mm -hmm. so our little canned aperitif is made from just the liqueur as the base it is really excellent for you. It is a cool product. I think it's amazing. But like, I also want someone to just pick it up because it's like cute and tastes good. And it doesn't actually matter to them that like, that's a part of it. Like, mm -hmm. I want it to be indirect, you know, like, at the same playing field as like a high noon. Like, yeah. it just takes, you know, none of like, high noon's not talking about their like, nutrition benefits. Coca-Cola yeah. doesn't talk about like any environmental mm -hmm. thing, you know, like these are not the keys to success for those, that category necessarily. And so like, yeah, I don't know. Like, I gotta, I, yeah, I, I gotta agree with you. Right. And we've, it's, it's, it's really cool to hear someone that's like doing some pioneering work in the Akbev space, um, talk about it on the podcast for the first time. Cause it super aligns with, I think, what Kyle and I's takeaways have been from all the the mainly retail food and bev stuff that we've done, mainly food is just con there's not a there's not a critical mass of consumers that care enough. So while you do want to cater to that one to five percent of people that are really going to care and you want to capture that beachhead market, like my opinion is you're going to anyway, 
right? Even if, even if you don't lead with it. And we know from a psychological perspective, like those are not the leading value props that drive purchase. It's still flavor, you know, convenience, uh, taste, price, how it looks. So it's exactly what you're talking about. And we've had a couple of guest blogs and other people have commented on it. And there's been terms kind of thrown around like the Trojan horse strategy or, you know, whatever it is, but yeah, the way yeah. that I frame it up is you just have to win on the fundamentals. Like you have to, it's, it's like table stakes. Like this is how you have to operate a brand that like actually is going to work. Totally. And then on the back end, I think you can attach all that other good stuff, like, and make it stickier and make people care more and make people feel good yes. after you lead with the positive yes. interaction of, I just consume the product and yeah. like the product and the brand is, is kick ass. Um, so for sure. And like, how cool is that to be like, giving people who wouldn't maybe necessarily be as compelled or curious about those aspects from like a decision to purchase mm -hmm. point of view, but like mm -hmm. they're coming at it from the other side. They like found this thing and it didn't alienate them or make them feel like it wasn't for them. And then they're mm -hmm. like, Oh, and also these other things are part of this. And like, I do feel extra mm -hmm. good about it. Or like that is, that is mm -hmm. cool now to me because it's associated with this thing that I already found and like was sold on. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I don't have the Harvard business review case study to back this up, but like just as a consumer, as someone that's very, <laughs> you know, in the know on brand and, and branding, like it's kind of the difference of you either are cool or you are very clearly trying to be cool. And like brands that just are cool yeah, like, and brands that try to be cool don't. Yeah, or like showing versus telling is like a, mm. you know, a thing that you think about. And I have a kid. And so that's always big and like an educational component. But it's true for brands also, I think. Mm. Um, I want to give you a second to just dive a little deeper into the tasting room because I know that is opening. It's just mm. open. It's opening next week. Like we got, we got it's some. opening in a is, week. Yeah, let's go. Um, so I just want you to. <laughs> to chat about that and fill people in on what's going on there, why that's part of the strategy and why you're excited about that. Yeah, so we built this sort of um, little annex into our production space where it has a, a very small bar. People are gonna be able to come and try some blackcurrant cocktails, uh, which is huge because I think a big question around something that you know isn't as much of a mainstay on the bar like the thing that we make is like, mm -hmm. what do I do with it? And and how is it mm -hmm. good? And what what things can I be creative about? So having a place where we can kind of tailor that experience to people and show them like some really mm -hmm. awesome things and applications for this product, like that's amazing. You can mm -hmm. taste the liqueur, you can see a little bit into our production process, understand a bit more about black currants. We're also planting in black currants in the spring. And so there will then, there are some already planted, but the ability to actually like see the plant to talk about like wow. how those fruits grow and like yeah. look at them and touch them and be like, okay, like have a little bit more recognition with that. Um, yeah. And then we also have this really amazing culinary capacity as well. So we're uh, like a little provisions market. So it's gonna be a picnic haven where people can buy like things that we're growing oh, yeah. in the garden that have been turned into a packaged good that's just like so fresh, so interesting. And like, you could take that, you could picnic here, you could picnic somewhere else, you could take it to a dinner party or cocktail party kind of like have it as something that you keep in your fridge. We're so, so excited about a lot of the things. And there's like this red thread to black currant with a lot of those as well. So things like the compote or we're making a version of dolmas, but with black currant leaves as mm. the wrap rather than grape leaves. And so those have been really fun wow. to start to like understand and play around with. Um, and you'll be able to, you know, discover and buy a number of, really amazing products from New York state producers that we're super excited about. So people like, you know, another moon brewing, left bank ciders, Arrowwood farm, Suarez, La Salina, like matchbook, um, people that are making really agriculturally driven, um, really cool things and they'll change out frequently. And, um, yeah, I, th I hope that it's a place of, of discovery and, and sort of respite. We want it to just be like, Take a little pause in nature, have a moment, try some new things. Yeah, I love it. I have one logistical question and then kind of a, a general comment. Logistical question is, this yeah. is in Rhinebeck, New York, correct? Mm-hmm. 
And if That's if people correct. want to find it, if they want to like Google map it or like search something, what's the best way for them to find it? Just search the, the brand name or something else? Yeah, we're, yeah, we're, you can search the brand name, go to our website. It's ccc.com. We're at 108 right. Salisbury. There's a whole page on our website about visiting us. And that has info on the tasting room hours, but largely, you know, it's open on the weekends. It's a daytime thing. Um, cool. Close, it. close well, to the Rhinecliff train station. It's, it's incredibly clear the amount of intentionality and thought that's gone into it. So congrats on kind of getting to the finish line or, or I'm sure what feels mm -hmm. like one of many finish lines. Um, I can't wait <laughs> Thank to come. You. It's been a yeah, long yeah. process. Yeah. yeah. Um, my, my overall like macro changing consumer demand comment is region has to link itself with foodie culture, just like local food did for us to be successful because we have to like harvest those opportunities of people sitting down at a bar or restaurant or coffee shop or a tasting room or whatever for education and awareness building and awesome, impactful experiences. Um, because even though I'm so bullish on region brands doing this with demos at the grocery store, like it's just, it's just not the same. Right. And, and I think it has a much higher leverage potential to have an impact on how people consume, what they consume, what they share about it. Like there's just something really fucking cool about it. Honestly, like, there's a coolness factor that you really just can't quantify. Um, so I'm also yeah. just super bullish on brands that find a way to attach themselves to that foodie culture in food service, in hospitality as like a high leverage point of, of emphasis. Yeah, totally. I mean, I think I also tie it to just that like experimental joy place of like, mm. Mm. That being the the most fruitful lesson of of mm. anything is like having something that really sparks your curiosity or delights you in a way that you weren't necessarily expecting, and so just having more moments for that in life. Yeah, I love that. They give me chills. Um, last last two questions to bring us home, Rachel. First one being just. <laughs> Anything that we haven't talked about that's in the future vision or that you want to share about future products or future distribution or tasting room V2 or, you know, vertically integrating and <laughs> on the farm. Like I'm sure there's, I'm sure there's a million things, but um, what else in the future vision is, is, is percolating? Um, I, you know, there are, there are a million things all the time kind of sitting yeah. there and, and that we're excited about, but um most immediately, I think, is that um, we're going to have some really exciting wholesale products that are mm. in more of like the pantry or non-alcoholic world just as a result of, of being able to have this space and, and the ability Amazing. to make them. And so there'll be um, a dried tea blend that is going to be wow. available in the tasting room and then slowly but surely in, in more locations. But it's this blend that ties to the botanicals that we use in the cassis liqueur. And then it's just something that I've been drinking a lot at home, which is black currant leaf tea with cardamom and lemon verbena. Um, mm. And so we're going to start off with that in just like a, you know, single large batch. It'll come with the sachet in it. You can make like a big sun tea or just a giant hot tea. Oh, it's, go. it's good for you in a number of reasons, but it'll be really fun. Um, and then, and then, yeah, all the, all the like things that we've learned from living or not living, but like being on this property and working with this mm -hmm. land and space for a year mm -hmm. and how we can carry that into the next season, both in our market garden and our farming practices and introducing more black mm -hmm. current plantings for more like, you know, the equivalent of like an estate grown thing. But for me, I think it's more, mm -hmm. it's most compelling because people are so unfamiliar with black currants. And so if they could come here and like walk in fields and actually like see the fruit and try it fresh, like that's, I mean, that feels really motivating. Yeah. I, I'm smiling as you're saying that. Cause I, one thing I really admire about you is you're just, you're in it, right? Like this is our first phone call where I think you haven't had a hairnet and a lab coat on because you're literally just like coming off <laughs> the, the production floor, like making the actual product. So I just, <laughs> I salute you for that. Yeah, and I did my hair. I put, I put the makeup on today. Yeah. <laughs> um, love that. Well, exciting, exciting stuff on the horizon. Um, last, last question is kind of taking it macro to the, the question we asked everyone, um, which feel free to take your time because it's a big one. Um, how do we get regenerative brands that have 50% market share by 2050? 
Ooh. I mean, I think we already touched on it a little bit. Like, Mm. don't talk about it. Like, get in the back Mm. door. You know, Mm. there's like, like, have Mm. those core values and get that out there to as many people as possible. Because I do, I like, I really do believe that there is this like, as much as that can be compelling to people and the ways that, Mm. you know, labeling or environmental alignment can really sell in, like you said earlier, like those people are going to come to the things anyways. And a lot of times I think there's like this, this like exclusionary or polarizing way. Like I don't, we didn't talk about this at all and it's too late to start it really, but Mm. I'm sure you've encountered that like regen itself can be like a polarizing idea and among farmers, farming practice, you know, there's just like, there's a lot of misunderstandings about it and its practices and impact. Um, And so, yeah, I mean, I feel, I feel like keep doing, like keep spreading that in terms of like how you're talking about your brand with people, how you're communicating with other makers and like how you can encourage more regenerative practices across the board. And then on the branding and like consumer product side, like almost just like downplay it let it be like Mm -hmm. let it be the like the grace the like icing Mm -hmm. this like thing that is central to you but like Mm -hmm. doesn't have to be central to the person to like Mm -hmm. be converted to the thing that you're doing yeah i don't know what do i know Uh, i don't have a harvard mba either (laughs) <laughs> no, I, I, I so agree. I, I so agree. And I had a really, I, I had a nice spicy conversation about this this past week at the RFSI forum, which is a, a, a forum about investing in regenerative agriculture. And Claire from Western Rain Creative was there and she's amazing. And she was the media partner for the event. Um, they work with, you know, regenerative farmers, ranchers, brands, other organizations like the Savory Institute. So shout out Claire and, and what they do. Um, but we were having a, a, a kind of moment of contention around how do we communicate the, the beauty and the full like essence of regen, like in the way that we need to with consumers. And, you know, I, I was, I was not trying to water down or have a lack of respect for that, that awesome deep essence and story, but it also isn't the way that we know psychologically, like consumers like are buy more stuff. Right. And so maybe that just whole thing is yeah. so flawed and yeah. like, trying to kind of shove this into that system is like the wrong way. But my opinion is we're going to have to, at least in the short term. Um, so it's like, how do we yeah. do this dance between that beautiful depth and that essence and also like this two second attention span on the shelf at the bar or whatever to almost have that incognito approach that you and I've talked about today. And I think, um, I'm really excited about like that challenge. I think it's gonna be really, really hard, but there's a lot of amazing people kind of trying to build a brain trust to, to solve for that. Cool. I love that. Yeah. And I, I would love to kind of just continue to hear more about what those like philosophies are and what feels like it's impactful and, and successful on that, on that front. I, I think, you know, at least at the size that I'm at, which is so small, um, mm-hmm. and and with some other producers that that I really respect and love, I think that like being true to the value system that you know you have aligned already with regenerative mm-hmm. agriculture and reuse mm-hmm. and minimizing waste and like having that be central to you and like core to the operational side is like. Mm-hmm where you're just going to stay true to that vision and then just make the thing that you want to make, like put it out there in the most creative, like Mm. way that feels most aligned with like you and like what you're, what you're into, not necessarily Mm. the, like the messaging, the branding, the like teaching moment, like that will come, that will happen. Mm. Make a good product, make a thing that Mm. you stand by and that you really love. That's what people want. Right. Perfect (laughs) mic drop to close us. Um, this has been so amazing and so informative Uh, just appreciate you and all your work and thank you for joining us no thanks for having me this is fun absolutely any any you you gave the URL but Rachel will you give that again or the Instagram or any places where we can make sure people know yeah yes Totally. Go to our website at ccassis.com. So just C-C-A-S-S-I-S.com. Our Instagram is current Cassis. Uh, no dots, just it's an Instagram handle at current Cassis. <laughs> C-U-R-R-E-N-T. 
Love it. I know the inner. I'm cool and contemporary. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, those so go find us on the internet. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> Love it. Let me hear. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for joining us, Rachel. Thanks this is amazing. Hosting. Thank you. Absolutely. Well, talk soon. For show notes, episode transcripts, and more information on our guests and what we discuss on the show, check out our website, regen-brands.com. That is regen-brands.com. You can also find our Regen Recaps on the website. Regen recaps take less than five minutes to read and cover all the key points of the full hour long conversations. You can check out our YouTube channel, Regen Brands Podcast, for all of our episodes with both video and audio. The best way to support our work is to give us a five star rating on your favorite podcast platform, subscribe to future episodes, and share the show with your friends. Thanks for tuning in to the Regen Brands Podcast, brought to you by the Regen Coalition and Outlaw Ventures. We hope you learned something new in this episode and it empowers you to use your voice, your time, and your dollars to help us build a better and more regenerative food system. Love you guys.